usually I start with a outline and this is what I'm going to talk about, but I want to start with a sales pitch first and tell you what I'm working on and why you should be excited about it before I give you all the background about the project. So DRAGONS is an acronym I came up with because I wanted a cool one. Um, stands for DRAO Demons of the Northern Sky. It's a radio polarization survey that was observed here in Canada at the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory. Now, the only other radio uh, um, survey that was in polarization of the Northern Sky before this in history was the Dwingaloo survey, which had five frequencies. So there were five pictures taken of the northern sky in polarization, and this was the standard for radio astronomy for about 50 years. Um, and now the Dragon Survey is coming in to take the place of the Dwingaloo Survey, um, and they were observing the exact same sky, and you can see side by side that there we've got we're seeing the same stuff, which is very very um, comforting. But we're observing 8,175 frequencies. So that's considerably more than five. And so we have an outstanding amount of data um, that's going to be released when we complete the processing of this survey. And that's some of the reason why you should be pretty excited about some of the results that we're gonna be able to have coming out of Dragon soon. Um, now this is the outline for what I wanna tell you about today. And my experience, I've met people from the Royal Astronomy Society before. There's a wide range of knowledge. There are people, I've met who during the question and answer time, I could see they knew the answers to all the questions and they were just being polite. And I know that there are people in this room that have a wide knowledge range. And I also wanted to start at the beginning in case there were people who did not. Um, and so I'm gonna start at the very beginning and hopefully along this journey, I'm gonna pick people up along the way and we'll all end together. And so I'm gonna start out with radio astronomy and what is radio astronomy? So I have to begin with light is a wave, Mo mostly, it, it's, it's a wave. Um, it's made of oscillating electric and magnetic fields, uh, which is why we call it electromagnetic radiation. And so you can just picture light traveling through space like a wave um, traveling at the speed of light. And there's a little bit of vocab that you need for the rest of this presentation. One is wavelength. Wavelength is the distance between the two peaks of that wave. And so if it's coming through space, if there is a distance between two peaks arriving, um, that's called the wavelength. And then the frequency is how many peaks pass every second. Um, and as radio astronomers, we speak in frequencies and most other astronomers speak in wavelengths. And I'm gonna try to remember to speak in wavelengths today, but I might flip flop by accident. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Um, and of course, there's the visible light spectrum. The visible light spectrum is wavelengths in the range 750 nanometers to 400 nanometers. So really, really small. And every color of the rainbow has a different wavelength. But of course, there's wavelengths that you can't see with your eyes. Our eyes evolved to see the visible light spectrum, which just happens to be the peak of the sun spectrum and what is able to come through our atmosphere. Um, there is a whole spectrum of wavelengths we can't see with our eyes. Um, and this is called the electromagnetic spectrum. The visible light spectrum is just a little tiny piece of this. And so I am a radio astronomer, which means that I observe in the radio window. So the very, very longest wavelengths on the far end of the spectrum. Also shown here is the atmospheric penetration of the different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is one of my favorite things because you can see there's only two windows where light can reach the earth. One is in the visible light spectrum, which is why we can see light. Um, and the other is the radio window. And so we're able to do ground-based astronomy here on Earth in the visible range and in the radio wave range. All other astronomy and all other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum has to happen in space-based telescopes above the atmosphere so the atmosphere doesn't block it. And so great to be a radio astronomer because I can go see my telescope um, and I can actually like touch and interact with my telescope. Whereas if I was in another part of the spectrum, I, it would just be out there in space somewhere. And that'd be pretty cool, but it'd be not accessible to me. 
And this is my telescope. Uh, it's the DRAO 15 meter telescope. 15 meters is quite small for a radio telescope, even though it may seem quite large in the world of telescopes. Um, but the lovely thing about having a small telescope is that for the Dragon Survey, we were given six months of exclusive use. Um, so we didn't have to fight for access. It was our telescope for six solid months. Now, a radio telescope is an antenna. So the important part, the antenna part of this whole thing is the feed, which is the little piece at the top. Um, everything else are reflectors that collect up the light and bounce it into the feed. So that way the feed converts that radio signal that's light into electrical signals that are then interpreted by a computer. So different from an optical telescope, which looks at the sky and, you know, it gets sort of a picture of the sky and it can see a, a, a wide field at the same time. A radio telescope gets a dot and that dot tells us how bright the stuff that's entering that antenna is at that moment. And so in order to get a picture, we have to scan the sky and get a whole bunch of little dots. And those dots are combined into an image. So this, for example, is what we call a raster scan of Virgo A, which is a radio galaxy. And we achieved this picture that's on the left just by sweeping the telescope up and down Virgo A, getting the brightness at all sorts of little dots. And then that would be pieced together into an image um, with a computer later. My research takes place out at the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory. I'm particularly proud of this facility. I grew up in Western Canada um, and I'm really proud of Canadian research to begin with. And I think it's so cool that we get to have our own radio observatory. We talk about some of the big Canadian research facilities and it's really neat that this one is just a couple hours away over in the Okanagan. And so uh, the DRIO is Canada's main radio astronomy research facility. It's located just 20 minutes south of Penticton. It's considered to be pretty special among radio observatories because Penticton is a nice place to live. And there's not a lot of radio observatories where the people who work there can live somewhere nice mm -hmm. and then go to work. Um, and that's because the mountains block the observatory from the human generated signals, which keeps it um, shielded so that they can live in a nice town but still access the telescopes. Um, and it's been a world leader in radio astronomy for over 50 years. A lot of people don't realize that Canada is a world leader in radio telescope technology. Among the most famous right now is the CHIME telescope, which is the Canadian hydrogen intensity mapping experiment that's second from the end here. Um, it, there's no other telescope like it in the world, and it's starting to get incredible results. Um, coming soon, they're going to have a brand new telescope called CORD which is gonna be 500 seven meter dishes all laid out in a field. There's, it's gonna be a sight to see. And that's at the- That's at the DRAO, right. yeah. Um, so I threw in this, they've got public tours coming up um, every weekend for our, from spring until the end of summer. Um, and so if you're passing through um, the Okanagan region, it's a great place to stop for a wine tour and then go off to observatory. The observatory tours are really fantastic experience. Um, I know Wendell who does the tours um, and he spends the whole day out there, like meeting people at the gate and bringing them through the site. Um, absolutely worth it if you have a chance to go through. Yeah. Yes. I see really. Oh, yeah, I, just put that on Wikipedia and I didn't have a picture of the solar telescope. Yeah, That's so cool. He's speaking in May. Yeah. Well, let him know that his picture is appreciated. So. Um, that is the okay. solar flux monitor, which is the world's oldest solar observing telescope. Um, it's been observing since 1946. It started out in Algonquin Park and they moved it to the DRAO later but it's been continuously observing the sun since the 1940s. So it's a pretty special experiment. Um, okay, so I also need to talk about polarization. So light is a wave um, and I, I'm gonna try to make some waves here. We'll see how this goes. Um, yeah. I can help. I've actually got quite a few. I might get some help. We'll see. Um, so light is a wave. Um, 
And you might have had, you might have polarized sunglasses, so you might be familiar with the word polarization and have heard of this idea before. Polarization is the angle the light is traveling at. So if light is coming at you like this, the polarization is the tilt of that light. Um, so we don't get single waves coming at us. We get a whole bunch of waves, like waves from all the different sources bouncing around everywhere. And oh boy, in radio astronomy, there's a lot of radio waves bouncing around everywhere. So um, when we talk about polarization of light, mainly we're actually talking about the polarization characteristics of a group of light waves. And so if I've got, I'll just make three light waves um, as an example, completely polarized light. And the only thing I can think of that's really completely polarized is like a laser, something that was a very coherent source, um, or maybe what comes directly out of your sunglasses is now polarized. Um, completely polarized light. Yeah, this is, it all is, it might be like waving at different waves, but, but its angle is the same. And so if it was to come through a polarizing filter, all of it would make through because it's all coming in at the same way, the same angle. Now that's not the case for most light. In fact, most light is like the one on the end. The one on the end is just like one of every possible angle ever. And so if you were to average all of that, you would get no average polarization. It's all just like random. What we look at in radio astronomy usually is partially polarized light. And that's when, a little bit of it has a favorite angle. So there's a couple, like maybe 30% of the waves coming at us have a favorite angle and everything else is random. And we're able to measure that and that measurement of polarization gives us important information. So this is um, a picture from the Dragon Survey. This is the Northern sky um, at the wavelength 0 0.383 meters. Remembering that visible light is in the nanometer range. And this is like 0.38, so 38 centimeters. That's a pretty big wavelength. And this is the galaxy. On the one side, we have total intensity, so all the radio waves that reached our telescope. Doesn't matter their angle, just all of them. And on the other side is only the light that had a favorite angle. So only the light that we could pick out as, yeah, you have some polarization. And the radio sky is completely different in different when you look at it in polarization instead of total intensity. And that difference tells us what's out there. Um, before you ask, because this is, I think, a really important thing to realize, the hole is because we can't see through the Earth. There is a full sky out there, I promise, but the Earth is in the way in the Northern Hemisphere, so we can't see some of the sky. Um, and then that tail is because there's a bug in the data processing and we're fixing it. Um, it, it will be gone in the final version of the, of the maps, I hope. So why is the polarized sky different from the total intensity sky? Well, it has to do with what causes polarized light from space. And that is magnetic fields. So polarized light mainly comes from synchrotron emission. Synchrotron emission occurs when ultra fast or relativistic electrons are spiraling along magnetic field lines. And as they spiral along those magnetic field lines, they give off polarized, usually radio waves, but a fairly broad spectrum as well. Um, and so when you look at a polarized intensity sky, what you're actually looking at is evidence of magnetic fields. You, The only way you get polarized emission is if there is ultra fast relativistic electrons and a magnetic field. And so that already tells us something about the sky that we're looking at. And my research area is the galactic magnetic field. So um, I was doing this as a practice presentation for my boyfriend. Um, and we spent, I think, an extra hour talking about what is a magnetic field because it stresses him out. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you what a magnetic field is because it stresses me out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so to simplify things, um, fields 
exist to explain action at a distance forces, which are probably still the, one of the most confusing things in physics. The idea that the earth and the sun know about each other, even though they're not touching through the force of gravity, that's weird. <laughs> That's action at a distance. Um, gravitational fields in that case are produced by massive objects like the earth and the sun. Um, electric fields are produced by charged objects. And like the most classic example is if you rub a balloon on your hair, you can see the static. Um, magnetic fields are connected to electric fields. Well, electric fields are just charges. They're electrons and protons and matter. Um, magnetic fields are moving charges or current. And so when we say there is a magnetic field in the galaxy, what we're actually saying is there's moving charges in the galaxy. And that's it. Those moving charges come in the form of um, ionized gas. So gas that's given off its electrons. And now they're rotating around the center of the galaxy with the rest of the galactic matter. That's producing a magnetic field. And magnetic fields are really important. One of the things a lot of people don't realize is the electromagnetic force is vastly stronger than the gravitational force by an awful lot. The reason why gravity feels stronger is because gravity only attracts. So there's only pull. And so you can build up a lot of gravity. Electromagnetism has attraction and repulsion, so there's pushes and pulls. And so for every push, there's a pull and it sort of balances itself out. But the individual pushes and pulls are much more powerful than gravity. So magnetic fields have the ability to shape and manage the dynamics of the galaxy. Um, and we already know that they play a huge role in star formation. And my friend and our former um, PhD student at the University of Calgary, Mahush Tahani, um, played a big role in studying star formation and galactic magnetism. Um, it supports cosmic ray acceleration. So cosmic rays are super fast charged particles that come from space. And some of the cosmic rays, some of the most energetic ones come from magnetic fields, speeding up electrons and protons in space. Um, and magnetic fields support the vertical structure of the galactic dish. Without galactic magnetism, the disk would smoosh under gravity. Because what's stopping gravity from pulling everything together? Um, but there are other forces at play, and gal the galactic magnetic field is one of the ones that pushes back against that. I have a quick demo. It's not a very good one because um, this is the magnet I had at home. Um, it's And I, I had to bring it on the bus, so we had to cut the copper tube down to something backpack size. I didn't want to get stopped by transit security for like carrying around a giant copper tube. Um, but maybe you've seen this demo. Um, I'm going to actually pass it around the room because it's, it's fun. Um, so copper is not magnetic. Um, but if you move a magnet near something conductive, that creates currents. And currents produce magnetism. And so as this, as this magnet falls through the copper tube, currents are going to start moving through the tube. And that's going to turn the tube into a magnet that pushes back on the original magnet. So the important thing there is whenever a magnetic field is produced by currents, it always pushes back on those currents. Magnetic fields act to resist change. And so as the galaxy collapses, that magnetic field says, nope, and tries to push that back. So I'll do it quick. Um, so we know that roughly the speed of magnet, magnet should fall at. And it falls way, it would fall way, way slower if it was a better magnet, but you know. So as you're doing this, put your hand at the bottom and look down at it and you can see like it falls way slower than you think it should. And um, get yourself a good magnet and a proper copper tube. <laughs> <laughs> so, Hopefully, I've convinced you that galactic magnetism is important, and it's something we want to understand because it plays a role in the dynamics of our galaxy. Unfortunately, interstellar magnetic fields are really hard to measure. They're like one of the hardest things to observe. We know there's there because there's polarized emissions. They have to be there. But magnetic fields don't emit light. 
So we can't just measure, look at them with our telescope. Um, now we know about the Earth's magnetic field and the Sun's magnetic field because we've been able to put magnetometers out on spacecrafts. And we've actually been able to put things there that made direct measurements. We can't do that with our galaxy. Our galaxy is quite big. Um, it would take a while, like a long while. And one of the things I love about scientists is when we come up with creative ways to see invisible things. And that's what we've done with galactic magnetism. So we use this indirect method to try to detect the galactic magnetic field. Um, and that's by observing an effect called Faraday rotation. Um, Faraday rotation, this is when we start to arrive at the part of the talk where I dread because um, there are parts that are easy to explain and there are parts that are hard to explain. Faraday rotation is one of the hard ones. Faraday rotation occurs when a polarized wave passes through any region of space containing a magnetic field and a bunch of electrons. Um, and as it passes through that area, the polarization angle rotates. Now that would not be useful to us because how are we supposed to know it rotated? It's already arrived at us. We can't check what it was like before, um, except that the amount of rotation depends on the wavelength. So the, when we look at a whole bunch of different wavelengths, we see instead of all arriving with the same polarization angle that they came from, from their, wherever they were emitted, now we have a spread or a spectrum of polarization angles because that polarization angle changed as each wavelength rotated differently. And we're able to analyze the amount of rotation at each wavelength and reconstruct some idea of what magnetic field conditions might have caused it. So I'm going to play an animation. This is 244 wavelengths of the Dragon Survey. Um, and each of these is just a polarization angle map of the sky. And the reason why it's different in each um, each image is because each wavelength has experienced different Faraday rotation. And so we see, instead of seeing the same image over and over again, which is what you would actually expect. And when we look in just regular polarized intensity, it's literally the same image over and over again, slightly brighter, slightly darker, depending on what wavelength we're looking at, but we're looking at the same stuff. But when we look in polarization angle, because rotation is different for each wavelength, we see evidence of um, Faraday rotation there. Um, and this is actually unusual to be able to look at an am animation like this because uh, there's not actually a lot of polarization surveys that have this many wavelengths in them. Um, like I said, the Duane Blue survey had five wavelengths. So we could see the Faraday rotation, but it was like, eh, 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 eh. and we couldn't really tell what was happening in the in-between parts. Okay, so. Faraday depth is a number that we produce to describe the amount of Faraday rotation. And that's all you need to really remember is remember the Faraday depth is a number that we get that tells us the amount of Faraday rotation has happened. On one side, I showed you the math because there might be people in this room who like math, respect to that. On the other side is the math in words. Uh, the Faraday depth is the sum of all of the magnetic field and electric density conditions that the light encountered along the way. So the light's traveling along through magnetic fields and electrons, it's rotating along, and it adds up the knowledge of what it saw along the way. And that knowledge is contained in this number that is the Faraday depth. So from that number, we can figure out something about the magnetic field. It's hard. This is like, um, some of my friends have heard me give talks about Faraday depth, sometimes more mathematical talks over and over again. And every time they're like, I'm still confused. And the reason why they're confused is most of the time we can't imagine that you can get anything useful out of this number. A large number for the Faraday depth means one of three things. There was a magnetic field. There was an awful lot of electrons and the light came a long way. And we can't actually tell which of the three or whether it was all three. Um, but that's the information we have. We're trying to measure an invisible thing. And that's why this is hard work to do. 
So that brings me to telling you now about the Dragon Survey. I told you a little bit about it, but now I'm going to tell you um, more about what we're doing and why, because I think you now have the background. So Dragons is part of a larger project. Uh, so there's like four or five of us working on Dragons right now as the core Dragons team, but we're a part of a really large group of scientists from across the world who are members of the GMIMS Consortium. So GMIMS is an international effort to map the entire polarized sky. So you remember the hole in the southern part of the sky? We have partners in the southern hemisphere um, at the Parks Observatory who are measuring the other half. And actually they've let me operate the Parks Telescope from here in Canada because they love Canadians because we're awake at night for them. Um, and the only problem is when things go wrong, you can't call anyone because they're all asleep. Um, but the, so we have ob observations happening in the south for GMIMS. We also have three different wavelength ranges because we're trying to cover an incredibly broad range. Um, Dragons is the lowest frequency range or longest wavelength range of the Northern GMIMS survey. And to some extent, it's one of the more valuable of the Northern GMIMS surveys because the longer the wavelength, the more Faraday depth information we get. Um, so it's, we already have some GMIMS data released, but Dragons is going to add an incredible amount to that. Um, Dragons was observed with the DRIO 15 meter telescope, which is tiny telescope in radio astronomy terms um, at the DRIO. It was built as a prototype for the square kilometer array. Um, and when they were done building it as a prototype, my supervisor, Tom, was like, could we have that? Um, and so they they let us use it for dragons. Um, and it was a six month observation process. And that's partly because we needed, remember I said that a radio telescope doesn't take a picture. It, it takes a dot at a time as it map moves across the sky. And it takes, if anybody's ever done cross stitch, it takes a while to make a picture. So we needed six months. And the other reason why we needed six months is we had to wait until some of that sky was in the sky so we could get all of the northern sky. So we observed in the summer and we observed in the winter. Um, and these were all taken of the telescope through the webcam in the control room. Um, with um, They didn't want us operating the telescope without seeing it because it was a brand new telescope and nobody knew if it would behave itself. So we had to watch it through the webcam. And uh, we took some pictures when it was a particularly nice day. And I wanted to include this as a shout out to um, the incredible team we had at that, the DRIO. Um, so a lot of radio telescopes are mesh on the dish. Mm -hmm. The DRIO 15 meter is special because it's a bowl, but bowls filled with snow. And so um, these guys volunteered their Christmas to come to the telescope and dig out the telescope. So we could continue observing over Christmas and we didn't miss any sky. Um, so. I think that's, a, and it gives you some perspective. When I say this is a small telescope, it's only small in radio terms. Okay, so how do we observe um, the sky? We observe by making the same two circles over and over and over again for six months. We go like this, and then we'd go like this. I'll show you what I mean. Ah, maybe I won't. I'm going to play there. Maybe. Oh, okay. Um, in any case, the telescope makes one circle and then lowers and then makes a lot another bigger circle and comes back up to the same smaller circle and then bigger circle. And it's not the telescope that changes it, the sky. And so every time we make a circle, the sky has moved and we make a different circle. And we repeat that for six months until the circles have covered the whole sky. And that ended up being 2,880 scans of the sky. Um, at, 8,175 wavelengths. It's several terabytes of data stored on a computer somewhere. Um, and this map here is what we're calling a spaghetti map. So you just plot the scans on top of each other. They're uncalibrated. 
So we finished observing in January 2023, and I have spent the last year and a bit trying to turn the scans from the spaghetti map into research quality data. And there's a lot of steps in there that I'm not going to talk about, just there's a lot of time that's put into making it less stripy. So I am happy to be able to share some really early results um, because we're here to talk about astronomy and I wanna show you, share some cool astronomy, um, especially if you're not as familiar with radio, there's some cool stuff in the sky and radio. So this is a polarized intensity image. It's all of the polarized emission detected in dragons across all the wavelengths we see in um, the dragon survey. And then I'll flip to the next one. This is the one that my friends are attempting to do an arts and crafts project. How many do we have made, friends? Fantastic. Okay, I'm gonna grab one. Oh, that was terrible. Oh, this is so beautiful, guys. Good job. Okay, for everybody online. Um, so this, we talk about projections and maps and maybe you're familiar with how we take the the map the globe of the earth and try to make it into a rectangle map and it skews things. Same thing as here. Uh, the, the sky is a sphere. It, it's around us. And we try to make pictures of it in two dimensions to see with our eyes, but it, they stretch things and confuse things. And so um, at the DRAO for tours this summer, they're making a globe out of our data. Um, and the company who's making that globe sent us a mock-up um, today. And so I printed them off today and invited some friends to help. Um, so I'm going to pass this around so you can look at the data. This is in equatorial coordinates, which means one side is the North Celestial Pole where the North Star is, and the other side is whatever's in Australia or Antarctica. The other, the other one? But yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Um, and uh, my printer is terrible, but there are, we plotted stars and our tour, um, the person who runs the tours at the DRO was all excited because he could see things. And we were all like, I don't know what those stars are. I'm a radio astronomer. Um, so I'm gonna pass that around and people can take a look at the data in 2D, but proper 2D. Um, so what does this information mean? This is information about Faraday depth. Remember what I said, a, a high number in Faraday depth can tell us that there's a strong magnetic field, a lot of electrons, or the light came a long way. And we aren't really sure which of the three. But one of the things we do know for sure, for sure, is a positive Faraday depth, which is red, means the magnetic field is pointing towards us. And a negative magnetic field, which is blue in this picture and on the globe, means the magnetic field is pointing away from us. So that alone tells us that there's some important information about some of these blobs that represent real objects in the sky. It tells us about their magnetic fields and the direction it's pointing. Now, let me point out some objects to you that um, we can see in the data. Um, the fan region and the North Polar Spur are the two brightest objects in polarization. And they are also the brightest objects in the whole sky. So we in the north have the best sky in radio because we've got these two really bright objects. Um, and we don't know what they are. There are some arguments that North Polar Spur is something that's coming out of the center of the galaxy. But if it is, it's really gigantic. Um, big things in the sky are either really close or really huge. like. Um, so if it's coming from as far away as the center of the galaxy, the North Polar Spur is a really massive thing. And so some people think it's probably a nearby thing, maybe the remnant of a supernova explosion. Same with the fan region. It's massive. So either it's very far away and gigantic, or it's something that's very close to us, and that's why it's so prominent in our sky. Um, and we're still trying to figure out what that is. There's a lot of debate. Um, we do know about these two objects, the Pertau shell and North Celestial Polu. They are, have been sort of newly researched, um, and the Pertau shell in particular was only discovered a couple of years ago. 
Um, and it's actually astonishing that it was a, discovered a few years ago and then it popped up so brightly in our data. Um, kind of wish we'd done this survey five years ago instead of. Um, so that's what I want to talk about is some of the cool things that you can see in the sky in polarization. So the per tau shell is a relatively nearby object. It's just outside of the local bubble, maybe 200 parsecs away. Um, it's a super bubble that's the remnant of two to eight supernova explosions. So if a supernova explodes, and then the explosion continues to expand. And then eventually, if a neighboring supernova explodes and that expands, they just end up bubbling together and becoming a like super thing. And if they think it's somewhere between two and eight supernova explosions combined, and then on either side of it is two major star forming regions, the Perseus and the Taurus um, molecular clouds. And so they figured these are actual distance measurements, the, the axis is on the picture in the left, which is really rare in astronomy to actually know how far away something is. Um, and so that was a pretty significant paper that came out in 2021. And then on the right, there it is in the Dragon's data. Um, and what we're trying to figure out now is what can we add to the knowledge of this object now that we have some idea of the direction of the magnetic field? Yeah. Was it discovery? It, it's a radio discovery. It wasn't was it necessarily a polarized. Um, like, how, no, how was it great, discovered? great question. So it was actually discovered by looking at the Perseus and the Taurus clouds. So originally, we knew the molecular clouds. So it was done in dust, uh, which is infrared. Yeah. Um, and I can talk more about that. It's a very cool discovery that they made. And it's an example of how um, the various, we need all the wavelengths to try to understand what's happening in the sky. That's the cool part, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll talk about that actually. I love I love it. I think it's really cool. I'm really envious of the dust astronomers. It is the time to be a dust astronomer. Um, so the there's a couple major satellite missions that um, look at light extinction as light from stars pass through clouds of dust. And so the farther away the star is, the more extinction it gets from the dust. There's another project that was able to very precisely figure out the distance to those stars using parallax. And it's a couple um, like NASA satellites. Um, and they they think it's some of the most precise measurements of distance to stars that they've ever had, and so many of them. So by knowing how far the stars are away and how much dust is in the way because the light is being extinguished by the dust, they're able to figure out how far away the dust is. So maybe there's a star here and a star here and a star here and a star here, and they figure out how much dust is here versus here to here versus here to here to here. And they do a lot of math and they've come up with a map in three dimensions of where all the dust is in the sky. And dust is one of the most important things because dust tells us where the star forming regions are. And so that's how they figured out the distance to that per tau shell. Because before that, we had the Perseus star forming region and the Taurus, but when you take a picture of the sky, it's two dimensional. And so who knows if they're like this or if they're like this. Um, and so without those distance measurements, they couldn't really tell that there was a cavity in the middle. Um, and that's the, the really big discovery that's been able to come out of modeling the 3D dust. Um, the North Celestial Pole Loop is another example of the dust people coming and making um, some pretty good discoveries. Um, North Celestial Pole Loop is, they think, the expanding cylindrical cavity left after a very dense hydrogen cloud fell down from the halo, so way above the galaxy, and fell through the galaxy, um, leaving this sort of wake in its path. And it's left behind this um, cylindrical hole that we just happen to be looking up into. And so you can see in the dragon's images how that could very well be looking in the front of a cylinder as we look down it. And um, Mayor, oh, I'm not gonna say this name right, Mayor D. Ricks um, was able to do this by looking at hydrogen and the movement of hydrogen in the sky. 
Um, and then the dust people, Marshall and Martin, came along and confirmed that by looking at the dust clouds that surround that expanding cylinder. Um, but it's never really been seen before. This is the first time we've seen it in Faraday depth. And when I looked at that first map of um, Faraday depth from dragons, it was extremely bright. I might actually go back to that. You can see it. Uh, sorry, everybody online. I'm going to get up line and point. You can see it right there. Um, it's the blue blob at the around 40 latitude. Um, and it doesn't stand out on any other Faraday depth pictures in like any research. And we looked at it and we're like, what is that? Why is that there? And um, so that's an opportunity to understand the magnetic field of this structure, which might be telling us how it's expanding or what it's expanding into. And then the last object we can look at is the fan region. We don't know what the fan region is. It's the brightest object in polarization. It's about 40% polarized, which means 40% of the light coming at us from the fan region has the same polarization. That's incredibly unusual. Um, and that indicates that there must be a very, very uniform regular magnetic field in that direction. It's the largest polarized structure in the Northern sky. And we've been debating what it is for about 60 years. It appears in all the surveys, everybody sees it. Everybody's like, oh, there's the fan region again. Um, and there it is in dragons. And we're hoping with 8,000 channels, um, 8,000 wavelengths, maybe we have something to add to this uh, question about the fan region. Um, so the questions are, is it near? And one of our collaborators, Jennifer West, um, has predicted that it could be as far as 50 parsecs away. A parsec is about 3.6 light years, um, which that's really close in like galaxy terms. Um, or it could be very far. Alex Hill, who's one of my collaborators and my friend Anna's supervisor, um, has found evidence that the W4 super bubble, which is two kiloparsecs away, um, is blocking some of the light from the fan region, which can only happen if the fan region light is coming from behind that object. Um, so, or maybe it's just very long. That's Jennifer West from Whitaker. Uh, yes, she's actually out of the DRL now. Yeah, yeah. She, she was one of us. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, Jennifer's my hero. Um, and you can see um, in dragons that same hole from the W4 object. So. That's confirmation of that, that it could be coming from farther away, but that's very confusing. Like, how could that be so far away? Because then it would be really a big thing. So then what is it? So that's where I'll stop. Just if here be dragons. <laughs> so when I named this survey, it was mostly because I wanted a cool name. Um, because the Southern Human survey is named Pegasus, and I was like, that's not fair. Um, we need a cool name. So I, um, we worked really hard on this. It was briefly the quail survey. That wasn't very majestic. I really tried to make Ogopogo work. <laughs> <laughs> There's just too many O's and P's. Yeah. Um, so dra dragons hit and I love it because, um, on maps, when you write here be dragons, it means that you don't know what you're going to see when you get there. And I think that's, I think the most exciting part of the work that we're doing is um, every time I look at an image, I'm the first person to see this image. So I'll stop and I have, I hope time for questions. Yeah, right, that's perfect. <laughs> okay, questions from the room, we'll start there. Yeah. So in your telescope, in elevation, you could do a circle. What is a circle? Is that a day? So it actually can do a full circle. Oh, you do. And it, the reason why we love this telescope, even though it's a little tiny, is it's really zippy. So it's able to do that circle in 12 minutes. Uh -huh. And the only hang up is that it can't keep going or the cables twist inside it. Mm -hmm. So it has to go back. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And there's actually, that was the reason why we had a webcam because um, 
originally there was a software bug where it would like go past that point and then get lost and then we'd like well, it would just be a worm. Um Is so that just bring the outcome down and rotate the that's, direction. Yeah, that's right. Oh. So yeah, we would do a circle and then tilt and then circle back. And we tried to randomize it so that way we weren't always doing the same scans in the same pattern. No, um so the question was, does it continue 24-7? I'm just going to repeat. Absolutely. It's okay. Fair enough. No. So no, it can't, we can't do daytime observing. Um, because, well, yeah, the sun is uh, very loud in radio. And with a larger telescope, you can point away from the sun. But with a, a smaller telescope, it, it's about a five degree beam at the lower frequency end, which means that the sun here might actually land in the part of the sky that if the telescope was here, it might still see the sun. Mm -hmm. um, well, especially in that rotation. Yeah. yeah. And then the second gotcha. reason is we're in a period of high solar, um, it, we're approaching solar maximum. Um, and one of the things I didn't mention is that the ionosphere is also a source of Faraday rotation. And so during the day, we get additional considerable Faraday rotation as that signal comes through the atmosphere. And we wanted to avoid that as much as possible by observing at night. And the third reason is people with their cell phones driving down that road make it nearly impossible to observe during the day. Mm -hmm. yeah. One more question in the room and then we'll go online over here. Uh, Do we have magnetic fields from planets is the question. So um, we probably couldn't with our telescope because of the, the, the size of the telescope. Um, you guys are optical people, so I <laughs> um, I have this this one. All right, so um, you might be aware that the bigger the wavelength, the bigger the telescope you need. Um, so this is the Green Bank Telescope. It's the biggest steerable radio telescope in the world. With a hundred, it's a hundred meters. It it's enormous. So I'd love to see it one day. Um, it has the same resolution as a optical telescope with a 0.24 millimeter aperture. So we just don't have the resolution in radio to see some of these smaller things in the sky. Um, we can with radio interferometers, which is a whole nother talk, um, but it's like impossible. At one point we tried to remove Jupiter from our data and realized there was nothing to remove. Um, let's go online. Simon, any any questions from the um, from the folks on the webinar? Yeah, um, we have a question. Uh, can you correlate or verify your results with the pulsar rotations? Um, yes and no. Um, so the I I think what you might be getting at, or a tangential thing that you could be getting at there, is. Um, you can actually get Faraday depths from pulsars because they're also sources of polarized emission and they pass through magnetic fields and electrons. And the nice thing about pulsars is we know where they are. So we can, if we know where the pulsar is, we know what the magnetic field that that pulsar light encountered and it gives us a data point. Um, the trouble is that we don't have enough pulsars to um, do that correlation easily. They tried with one of the Southern Hemisphere surveys, and I think they ended up having 10 pulsars, which isn't a very good sample to do a correlation study. But that's, the CHIME survey is about to publish a, a catalog of like, it's gonna many times improve the number of pulsars we have, and that may improve the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Any other questions, Simon? Yeah, there's quite a few. Um, do do strong extragalactic sources of radio signals affect your data analysis? Yeah, yeah. Um, there are are four calibrator sources which we used to check and make sure that the signal we were getting every day had the right units. Um, were Cassiopeia A, Cygnus A, Virgo A, and Taurus A. Um, but they also are in our data, and they're um, actually a massive pain because they're just like, they're super bright. I ended up just blanking them out every time that they, they were in a scan. 
So every time the scan passed through one of those, I just wiped out that data. Um, otherwise, it ended up leaving like lines in the maps. It's like Starlink for yeah. observers. <laughs> yeah. okay. uh, next question, Simon. Well, why don't you keep going if you have a few there? Sure. Uh, does your work help astronomers shed any light on dark energy and dark matter? Oh, I hope so, because that's how I'll get my Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> Great <don't>, answer. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I asked my supervisor that because I was like, hey, Joanne, I'm pretty sure they're going to ask me this, because this is one of the things I would like to know. And she was she said that there are some people that think magnetic fields could be a component of dark energy. There is certainly a lot of dynamics related to magnetic fields that we don't yet understand. Um, but I, I don't think it would be the, the only component to that myth energy that we're trying to figure out what it is. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, the planets are results of material material from a supernova. Is there an idea of radio remnants from that or those events? Okay. Can you say that again? The, the planets are a result of material from supernova. Is there an idea of radio remnants from that event or those type of events? So um, that's one of my favorite questions because the study of supernova remnants is um, a really important part of radio astronomy. Um, supernova remnants are something that's incredibly visible in the radio spectrum, but also um, something that they're very well polarized objects. Um, and so... <laughs> Larson at the back of the room here, um, who's, you guys online can't see him, I'm so sorry, but he's right now constructing paper globes, even though I think we're done with that part of the presentation. <laughs> they, they just, they, fine. Um, is, is doing his master's right now, looking at the Faraday depths or predicting the Faraday depths you would get from a supernova remnant. Um, and so that's the leftover explosion after the supernova, it just, nothing stops in space and so it just keeps on going and thousands of years later we still see this expanding shock um, and it's visible across all wavelengths um, and especially in radium i hope that answered that question great um we have another question um thank you so much for the fabulous and exciting talk and as someone who took up astrophysics and astronomy later in your professional life and career path, what, what would you say to encourage someone considering the same thing? Uh, do it. Um, I'm having the most fun. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, other grad students, but a lot of other grad students complain that like, I don't know, grad school sucks, life sucks, it's so hard. Um, but like I had a job before this. Um, <laughs> And it was hard. Um, and I'm just, yeah, exactly. High school students. <laughs> and I I love that I get to be curious and ask my own questions and um, drive the path of my life for a couple of years. And I also think uh, there is a lot of nervousness going in for me. I forgot a lot about my undergrad. Like there was a lot of knowledge that I thought I'd missed, but what I came in, I, like maybe that knowledge was harder to retrieve for me, but what I came in with was um, like a genuine excitement about doing the work as well as the time management skills that one develops over an adult lifetime um, are an enormous help in grad school um, as well as, I don't know, coping with stressful things. Um, I am having so much fun and um, people might say that it could be financially hard. It's been less bad than I thought it would be. <laughs> less bad. <laughs> I, I have, I have a story about that if I may. Yeah. So we, we were, we had um, one of our annual general assemblies. I think it was in Victoria in 2014 or something like that. Um, and we had a panel of professional astronomers and they were all introducing themselves. And of course, professional astronomers are spending half their time doing research and half their time getting funding to do the research. And one of the one of the astronomers said, I became an astronomer as they were introducing themselves. I became an astronomer for the money. 
<laughs> and everyone looked at him like he was out of his mind. He said, what, what did you do before? And he said, I was a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like your answer to that last question because maybe we're doing the wrong thing, sending our kids off to grad school too quickly and let them have life and then go back to it when, it, when it's something you love. Uh, yeah, I will say it would be harder with kids. Oh, that, yeah, that's yeah, one of the things yeah, that yeah, of course. I acknowledge that I don't know that I could do this if I yeah. also had to. Okay. Yeah, but um, it is we're seeing more and more older grad students yeah. um, and the University of Calgary, as well as other universities are starting to recognize that grad students need to be paid a living wage. Um, so we're starting to see light wage increases that are start are able to reflect mm -hmm. buying groceries and the times that we are living in today. Awesome. Simon? Yeah. Uh, does the radio data change depending on the season? Uh, rain, snow, forest fire smoke, anything like that? <laughs> yeah, um, that's that's a great question. Um, it does. The, the signal from the sky remains the same, and it's the signal from the sky that we want. Um, or at least we hope it remains the same. Anything that happens so quickly that it would change over six months is a very exciting astronomical event that we probably aren't going to capture in our data. Mm -hmm. um, so we're expecting the same sky, but we need to get out of the data all the other stuff that's in it. Some of that stuff is unremovable, and that includes cell phone signals, Wi-Fi. Um, some days are just particularly good days for cell towers to cross the mountains, I guess. So some days were just bad. Mm -hmm. um, there was a Russian satellite that popped by at the same time every day in one frequency every day in our data. That stuff can't be removed easily. Other things like the fact that the amount the mountains around the observatory emit radio waves, those can be removed because they're probably the same radio waves every day. If Simon, I'm going to ask you a question just to follow on there because um, the we're seeing constellations of low Earth orbit satellites. And the next thing that's happening there is um, handheld connectivity to those satellites with high powered cell towers, essentially. Um, yeah. What What's what's the future look for you folks? I'm hoping to uh, move to the Arctic and build a tower. But, but um, yeah. Yeah, so, um, as right now in our survey, we're measuring between 400 and 1,000 megahertz. And we are moving outside of our allocated radio frequencies. And so in radio astronomy, as well as just in radio broadcasting in general, everyone fights every, I think, four years. Everybody who has an interest in the radio spectrum gets together and says, I want this frequency. And these are cell communication companies and broadcasting companies, as well as radio astronomers. And radio astronomers have been able to preserve a few really narrow bands that reflect things that we we want to look at. For example, 21 centimeters is the neutral hydrogen emission line. And we've been able to protect, protect that range from all the other users of that frequency. But in Dragons, we've snuck out of our range. And so we're actually just listening in on everybody. So it, they're not breaking any rules. We just want that band too. Um, and so it's, we've lost, we, I say we have 8,000 frequency channels. We actually have about 6,000 because we've lost about 2,000 to um, other sources, mostly human sources. Simon, any more? Uh, yeah. Has there been any agreement about the age of the universe? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I um. I secretly wish I could study cosmology. I think it's really cool, but um, that's not my field of research. And uh, one of the funny things about being a PhD student is you become really knowledgeable about one really tiny thing. Right. Well, we have a question in the room. Yes, you mentioned uh, the web three parameters that you were. You need a distance, magnetic field, and the electron density. So how do you go about setting constraints on what 
each of those should be so you gotta really do it. Yeah. So the question was how do you um constrain the the data to either distance or yes. magnetic which field values or the distance to be which values the magnetic yeah. field and the so how do I take this number and turn it into information? Right. Um, that's a great question. So there's um, several ways that people are trying to do this. One is by modeling the magnetic field, by saying, OK, if the magnetic field looked like this, what would the Faraday depth sky look like? And if that matches the model, if the model matches the observations, that gives us a pretty good idea that that's what we're looking at. Um, the second thing that I'm trying to do right now is if I can match stuff we see in the sky to stuff that we already know about. For example, the North Celestial Pole Loop has a known distance. That constrains the distance, and then we can start looking at the physics of that object and deciding whether it should have a strong magnetic field or a lot of electrons. Um, so it's really, I think, coming down to very good modeling as well as partnering with other data sets um, to try to grab, get a, an overall picture of what's happening in the sky. So it's not something that can be done alone, but by collaborating with all the other sources of knowledge. But it's hard. It, it, it reminded me of a piece of a puzzle where you've got a 3D puzzle and I love the, the, the molecular piece and I, I don't know if there's a t-shirt for the dust astronomers, but I love that one. Um, but how that data that they're getting and that you're getting complement each other. Because um, we're not going to get the whole picture from any one source. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And so that's what we actually need each other. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, as I said, a PhD student, and I think most of us who are doing research in a field become really knowledgeable about our little corner of the mm -hmm. field. But I think we need to collaborate with people from all the other little corners and try to create uh, the bigger story. Mm -hmm. Any other questions in the room? Yes, we have one more here. Thank you, Betty. Hmm. But in the time, but in really with the change in the time, actually the way we did the solar field of time, absolutely. But in that garden, we did that. I have two answers to your question. So the question was, is there a time dependence to the galactic magnetic field? And is there any evidence of a time dependence? Um, so I did a data analysis project where we just got lucky that somebody had observed the same patch of sky over and over again for 10 years. Um, and so I was able to look at the Faraday depth information and found that there was dramatic changes mm -hmm. that I don't think is a changing magnetic field because changing magnetic fields give off light. And I think we would see that light. But what could happen, and this is another example of, it is a concern of ours, because we'd like to take this Faraday information as a, a fact that is unchangeable, is if a cloud of electron just happens to pass in front of the, like along the line of sight, it might enhance the information and then off it goes. And so there's questions about how time variable is this information? The second answer I have to your question of time variability of the galactic magnetic field is that's one of my secret fears that I really hope the people who are doing this modeling have thought of because the light takes a very long time to get to us, like 30,000, 40,000 light years. And so the information we're getting about the galactic magnetic field out here is 40,000 years ago's information. And so how are we supposed to know what, whether it's still the same galactic magnetic field? And are we just modeling an, an image in time instead of an image in mm -hmm. space? Um, and I don't know the answer to that, but that's one of my secret worries um, that I'm hoping that the people who are doing the modeling have already thought of. And I think they're pretty smart, so I don't think they have. It's nice that you're getting some of that distance data, or at least from, I think it was a Hipparchos study that did the parallax 
really, really in fine detail. But, yeah. But it still only gets so far. And um, yeah, that's interesting. It's the, one the, the time piece, which equates to distance, um, how does that relate to yeah. the data? It's because the same with the. Um, does it have an evolutionary cycle as same well? Same with the spiral arms. We yeah. think that the spiral galaxy, but we're looking back 40,000 years in exactly. time, and there was an arm there then. Who knows what's there now? Fascinating. Simon, can we go one more question from your uh, from online, and then we'll probably have to wrap it up. We're coming up on top of the hour. Yeah, there's no open questions, so we're good to go. Okay. okay, and no further questions in here. Rebecca, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Man, those are great questions. And and it just it it just opens the door to a whole lot more questions, but. We, we, we should probably call it. Yeah, I just um, want to wrap up by, again, encouraging everyone to go out and see the DRAO. Yes, um, two important things. One is to encourage radio astronomy to continue in Canada. And that inquires not requires not just scientists to be study about, excited about it, but the public, too. So do your part and give that site a visit. Also, the same way you guys are concerned about dark skies, we need everyone to be concerned about the radio environment that we live mm -hmm. in. Um, and so starting to learn about that and see some of the work that is at risk as we increase our radio human broadcast. 